Please clean the filter. Jaya Radha Madhava So welcome to our ongoing study of the Sri Ishopanishad. Last time I was here, you remember? We studied the Ishopanishad, right? So we're going ahead here, the Ishopanishad course, we're continuing tonight. Lesson 3, we covered already the introduction and then the invocation mantra. So tonight we're going to look at mantras one to three in the Ishopanishad.
Sri Ishopanishad, Prabhupada subtitles it, the knowledge which brings one closer to the personality of Godhead. Hare Krishna. All right, so, mantra one. We can chant, please repeat, Esavashyam idam sarvam Yad kincha jagat yam jagat Tena chak tena bunjita Magrida kasha svetanam This is a very important mantra often quoted and it's one of the mantras which the devotees who study Bhakti Shastri have to memorize. So it's very good. Those of you who are studying seriously these books, Prabhupada's books, you should try to memorize some of the nice slokas which are introduced here. So in the Ishopanishad the invocation mantra and this first mantra are memorization slokas. Do you remember the invocation mantra, Prahlad? Yes. Tell me. Translation. The Personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. You don't remember anything? You don't know the meaning of the… you know the verse in Sanskrit, you don't know the meaning? The Personality of Godhead is perfect and complete and all emanations from Him such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as the complete whole. Even though so many complete units emanate from him, still he remains the complete balance. So Purnam, Purnam means perfect and complete. And Om is the complete whole, the Personality of Godhead. So the Personality of Godhead is described as perfect and complete. And although so many universes are coming from him, still he remains complete. So this is a very important sloka. And then this is mantra one. The, this invocation mantra is actually not part of the Ishopanishad. But here's mantra one, the meaning, everything animate. Animate means living. Conscious and inanimate means like dead matter, like the table or the chair. These things, they're, they're inanimate. They have no consciousness, they're not alive. But everything animate means humans, the trees, the animals, the birds, the fish, all different forms of life they are animate. So everything that is animate or inanimate, meaning everything that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept, therefore, only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota. And one should not accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. So, very important mantra we are told here how we should accept only those things which are necessary for ourselves, only things which we are going to use. You know, we are living in the modern society, we call it the modern society, we, we sometimes call it the consumer society. We consume a lot of things, right? 
You like to go shopping, don't you? Yes. You go shopping, even the ladies came here from Malaysia and they went shopping. <laughs> you know, although everything here is coming from Malaysia, you know, they come here and they go shopping, you know, and, and everything here is much more expensive than in Malaysia. But still they think, no, I have to go shopping. And so it, it's part of the lifestyle of the, the consumer society. And nowadays, of course, people don't even go shopping, they simply go on the internet. You go online and you order everything, right? And you have, uh, you have all of these different uh, services which deliver everything to you online. Amazon and all these different kind of companies, they're bringing everything to you. You just look it up on the internet and you decide what you want. Yes, yeah, send it to me, you know. And then the, the next day or that day itself even the vehicle comes and they bring you the, what you ordered. You know, I was in Mayapur. <laughs> I was in Mayapur and it was locked down. But devotee said, I want to have some buckwheat noodles. <laughs> and he went on Amazon and he ordered buckwheat noodles. And you know, the same day the vehicle came with the buckwheat noodles. <laughs> yeah. So you can get everything you want on the online. Anyway, we're told we should accept only those things which are necessary for himself. We shouldn't accept more than what we need. We should take only what is our quota. In other words, what, what is sufficient for ourselves, what we need. We don't need more than what we you know, that Our tendency is to want more. You know, one pair of shoes is not enough. <coughs> How many pairs of shoes do you have at home? Just think, yeah? I went to one person's house, I thought I was going in a shoe shop, you know? <laughs> With so many shoes, you know? And then Srila Prabhupada also said, the average lady will not be satisfied unless she has at least 30 saris. <laughs> right, Mataji? Yes, you see? Yes. They must at least 30 saris. That's a, I mean, you open the wardrobe and you'll see a big line of all these beautiful colors and cloths. And, and at the end you'll see a pair of trousers for the man, you know. <laughs> man has one or two pair of trousers and ladies have a big wardrobe full of clothes, beautiful cloth. And so, anyway, that, that's the ladies, that's their quota. Ladies like to dress, they like to look nice, you know. So, it's all right, you know, it's part of the quota. You know, ladies, ha they expect these things. Just like if somebody's a businessman, then a businessman, he will also have to have a suit, he'll have to, have, he'll have to look good, you know, to present himself to the clients, to the customers, and so on, to go in the market. And so according to your dharma, according to your vana, your occupational duty, you work and act in particular ways, you know. And somebody who has a, is a businessman, you know, if he comes along on his bicycle, people will think, what kind of business is this man having, you know? He's just riding a bicycle. We would expect him to have, you know, a nice motor car, a good car and, you know, to look worthy for his position. So this mantra is telling us, anyway, we shouldn't accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. Our quota. Now what is our quota? Just like for the cow, what is the quota for a cow? For the cow, the quota is grass. 
You know, the cow's happy to get grass. He doesn't say, no, no, I want something, I want, the, you know, you have to give, you know, you give the cow some grass and they're happy. But uh, that's the quota of the, for a lion it's a bit different. Now if you're giving a lion grass, that's not going to work, is it? You offer some grass to the lion or the tiger, they'll, look, they'll think, what are you, you crazy? <laughs> no, their quota is something else. Their quota is the flesh. You know, they like the flesh, even, even, and they like even human flesh, you know. That's a special taste for them. So th that's their, something of their quota. For the human being, what is our quota? Our quota also, we should understand the quota, that our quota is food offered to the Lord, prasadam. Our quota is whatever is offered to Krishna, not meat, fish and eggs, but nice prasadam, fruits, grains, vegetables, milk and milk products. These things, these are the quota. Some people need to eat more, some people need to eat less. People generally like to have three meals in the day. Some places, some people like the monks, the Buddhist monks for example, they only take two meals a day. They won't eat in the night. They won't eat after midday even. If you're in Thailand, in countries like that where the monks are, you see the monks, they only eat in the morning and they're out there begging in the morning for their food and they will eat in the morning and the afternoon and evening they won't eat. So like that, that's, that's their quota, it's different for different people. Some people need to eat more, some less. The elephant has to eat several kilos of food every day. Our elephants in Mayapur, they take a lot of food every day. They need food. They will eat a lot, but they will eat leaves. They will eat uh, plants and leaves. They're not going to eat flesh. They have their quota. So we have to know what is the acceptable quota. And we shouldn't be anxious to take other things, knowing well to whom they belong. We should understand there's a proprietor behind everything, right? The cars are outside. If we say, oh, whose is this car? Oh, if we say, oh, it's nobody's. Is that likely? No. Every, all the cars out there, they belong to people. Somebody owns it, right? Somebody has their keys for it and the part that they belong to someone. And, the, and they say everything is owned and controlled by someone. And ultimately, the ultimate controller of everything is the Supreme Lord. Of course, this has already been described in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna describes the peace formula. At the end of the fifth chapter, right? Do you know the verse? The end of the fifth chapter? The peace formula? Who knows the verse? Nobody knows the verse. Huh? Bhaktaram, Bhaktaram Yagna Tapasham Suridam Thank you, yes. So Lord Krishna is describing his position that the ultimate purpose of all yagnas and tapasyas and sacrifice is for his pleasure. And he is Maheshwa. He is the proprietor of everything. Maheshwa. 
sometimes, of course, in the material world, people are also Maheshwar, you know. <laughs> but actually, they're Maheshwar Das. The real Maheshwar is the Supreme Lord, Lord Vishnu, Lord Krishna. He is the proprietor, he is the owner of everything. Why he is the owner of everything? Because it all comes from him. Nothing is actually ours. When we came into this world, we did not come with anything. Right? In Hindi, what did they say? Kalihath ayate, kalihath chalo. Right? You come with nothing in the hand and we leave with nothing in the hand. But we point out, when we're born, our hands are closed. We're coming to the world to get something. But when we leave the world, when we die, we open the hands. We leave everything behind. We take none of the objects of the world with us, but we do take our karma with us. We take our desires with us. They come with us in the form of the subtle body. The subtle body accompanies the soul at the end of life. So if we have a strong desire to control and to own things, we'll take that with us to the next life. And somebody who has a strong desire, if they're very pious, they may be awarded that position, they may become like a, a ruler of a kingdom. Just like you have different rulers, you have a king of England and you have a queen of Belgium or like the different royal families even in the Middle East they have Arab rulers, the ruler of the kingdom of Bahrain and like that and here in Malaysia you have also the different uh, rulers, right, of the different states here, the sultans. So they had that desire to control and to be a proprietor. But they are representatives of the Supreme Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna himself said, among men I am the monarch. So the monarchs, the rulers, they are representatives of the Supreme Lord, of Lord Krishna. They are on acting on his behalf as a proprietor. And so we offer our respect to them because they have gained that position as a result of their own piety and their activities in previous lives and they have been rewarded. Someone else less qualified, they may become the queen bee. You know, in the beehive, there's many bees and so many bees are all collecting the pollen and they're bringing the pollen to the queen bee and the queen bee is there controlling all the other bees. Everyone is the servant of the bee. So like that, there are different levels of controllers. But the ultimate controller, the supreme controller, is the Lord, the Lord of the universe, the, the supreme Lord. So we have to recognize him as the proprietor. And we should not take more than we need because we know that ultimately everything belongs to the Lord. And whatever we take, we should use it in the proper way. We should not abuse it. Right? So, we should understand some of the words in the mantra. Isavasya. Just like this mantra, this uh, book we're studying is called the Ishopanishad. There are many Upanishads. So, this is the Isha Upanishad. Isha meaning the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Controller. So Isha, by the Lord, and Avashya, owned and controlled by the Lord. We want to recognize this, and we should develop this kind of consciousness. 
One in Krishna consciousness, one who is a devotee, will understand that the Lord is the owner and controller. We, th this is Lord Jagannath's temple. We're here in the temple, we don't think this is my temple. This is Lord Jagannath's temple and we are here as a servant. We have come in this way to give service to him. We have to recognize who is the controller. We say in the Chaitanya Charitamrita it said, Ekala Ishwara Krishna or Sabhritya. There's only one Ishwara, only one controller and all others are his servants. One time Srila Prabhupada was in the very beginning of our movement. So there was this one man, he was a, you know, he was a, like a tramp or something, you know. But somehow he was coming, he was attracted to the devotees. And at one point he asked Srila Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji, I want to get initiation. So Prabhupada looked at him and said, okay, he said, if you want initiation, you have to answer two questions. And so Prabhupada asked him, first of all, who is God? And the man said, Krishna is God. And then the Prabhupada said, and who are you? He said, I am his servant. And Prabhupada said, okay, very good, you can be initiated. <laughs> so, very important basic point to understand. Krishna is the Supreme Lord. God, of course, has many names. In different faiths and traditions, they'll have a different name for God. And ultimate, Prabhupada says, actually, there are many gods. You know, you have the wind god, the rain god, the fire god, the god of wealth, the god of health. So many different gods, right? In, in Vedic culture, there are 33 crore different devas. 33 crore means 330 million different devas. So, which one is God? <laughs> it's it's a, a lot of work to go through them all to find out who is God. At one point they sent Brigamuni round Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva to test them. And Brigha Muni, of course, he, un he came to the conclusion that Vishnu was actually the supreme. Lord Shiva was more influenced by the mode of ignorance. Some tamas was there. And Lord Brahma was influenced by passion. But Lord Vishnu was totally in goodness. So Brigha Muni came back and told all the sages that Vishnu is the Supreme. So they say, of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu or Krishna is the Supreme. Aradhanam Sarvesham Vishnu Aradhanam Param. Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Lord Vishnu is the Supreme. He is the Supreme Lord. But in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada points out, he said, in some, sometimes it's better to speak about the absolute truth than to speak about God. Because if we speak about God, people say, oh my God, oh your God, oh Christian God, Hindu God, like this, you know, Muslim God. We think there are different <coughs> gods. There's only one God, there's one Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada said it's more clear if we talk in terms of the absolute truth, when we speak about the ultimate supreme controller, we call um, the form of the absolute truth. So th this is a better way to understand God. So everything animate and inanimate, para prakriti, meaning spiritual energy. What, where is that Paraprakriti? Just like all the living entities. We are all souls. So our soul, our soul, every one of us, we are all souls. Our soul is spiritual energy. It's not material. 
the Buddhas, they cannot understand that. They, they only know about material energy. They don't understand that there's another energy which is spiritual. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes this. In the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna is describing the material nature. And first of all, he describes the, the apara-prakriti. You see, there's para-prakriti and apara-prakriti. You see, apara-prakriti, meaning the material energy. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, seventh chapter, Lord Krishna describes first apara-prakriti, meaning the inanimate material energy. He says, Bhumerapo nalo vayu kammano buddhere vacha ahankara iti yame bina prakritet ashtada. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Altogether, these eight comprise my separated material energy. Right? The table, the building, motor cars, they're all inanimate. They don't have life. And they're made up of all kinds of different elements, different combinations of these elements. Just like our material body is also a para prakriti. The body is alive only because the soul is present in the body. When the soul leaves the body, then there's no more consciousness, no more life in the body. What is the body made of? The body is also made of earth and water and fire and air and ether. These things are all there in the material energy. But then Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, he goes, continues to say, Apariyamitastvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yedam daryate jagat. Lord Krishna is explaining that there's another energy which is also prakriti, but it is superior prakriti, it is spiritual energy. So it is called para-prakriti. The apara-prakriti is the inferior prakriti. But the soul, the spiritual energy is para, it is superior energy. Why is it superior? Who can say? Why is it superior, Ganesham? Why is the soul superior to matter? Huh? Yes, well, never die, yes. Why? Why, why, why would, why doesn't it? Because it has, soul has consciousness, right? The symptom of the soul is consciousness. Just like the symptom of the sun is sunlight, the rays of the light. So the symptom of the soul is consciousness. Where there is life, there will be consciousness. And that consciousness comes from the soul which is situated in the material body. So that is spiritual energy. Therefore we say everything, animate and inanimate. What is animate is the spiritual energy. Not only here in the material world is the spirit soul, but in this, there's a spiritual world. Beyond the material world, there's the spiritual world. And it's all spiritual energy there. In Vaikuntha, in Goloka Vrindavan, everything is full of spiritual energy. But here in the material world, material energy. But it has life because the soul is also here. So the material world here, there's a combination of spiritual energy and material energy. 
This spiritual energy is giving life to matter, giving life to the body. So we want to understand how there's a, these two energies, they're both prakritis, right? And above prakriti there is purusha, right? In Hindi language purusha means male, male is supposed to protect the woman, take care of the woman, provide for the woman. Uh, so, but in spiritual technology there's only one purusha. And who is that purusha? Krishna, the Supreme Lord, yes. He is the purusha. And all others are prakriti. We are the prakriti, we are his energy. He is the energetic. A quote from Prabhupada, there is nothing in the universe that does not belong to either the para or the apara prakriti. Therefore everything is the property of the Supreme Being, everything. That's a big statement, try to understand that there's nothing in the universe that is not either para or apara prakriti, everything. Everything that you see, the buildings, the trees, the roads, the cars, the ocean, the sky, the planets, everything is the property of the Supreme Being. Prabhupada then explains Bhagavad Communism. In Srila Prabhupada's time, Prabhupada of course came from Bengal and in the 1960s there was some communist movement. Actually Bengal, the state of Bengal was under the Communist Party. The Communist Party of India was ruling Bengal, it ruled Bengal for many years. Nowadays uh, Mamata Banerjee is there. She's a, a little different, but before her there was, it was a communist party which was ruling. And the communists, you know, naturally they, they wanted to take over everything, <laughs> control it. And Prabhupada was putting on a big pandal. At one point we had a big pandal program, a big, means a big gathering, a big, a big field with a big stage and invited all the public, all the people in Calcutta, they were all invited. But it was very dangerous to come out at that time. Many big men had been murdered by the communists. The communist re revolutionaries, they were killing different big rich businessmen and people were a bit afraid. But Srila Prabhupada put on his program and they even, at one point, even a group of these people came to meet Prabhupada and Prabhupada spoke with them. And you can see here, Prabhupada is speaking also about the, this communist. But because as the communists say, everything belongs to the state, right? The, in other words, there's no private ownership. Nothing belongs to the individual. Everything is owned by the state. In the world today there are five countries which embrace the communist doctrines. Uh, of course particularly China and then Cuba and then North Korea and then also Laos and Vietnam. These five countries are still following communism in different ways, you know, they don't all follow it the way it's actually meant to be, but, you know, they call themselves as a communist state. And the principle is no private ownership. <laughs> and the, the idea is everyone should be more or less the same. There shouldn't be high class, very rich people and very poor people. 
everyone should be more or less about the same standard of living. It doesn't happen. But they talk, this is the theory, the communism was, pre it was presented by a person called Karl Marx. He was a, a German and he sat in the British Museum for years and he wrote his doctrine on communist, communism. And this doctrine is a Marxism, this philosophy is taught and it's compulsory education in these communist countries. The people have to be in, indoctrinated into this thinking that everything belongs to the state. So Prabhupada said, mm, we kind of, uh, you know, we, we can agree to some extent, everything belongs to the state, but we say on everything not belongs just to the state, but we say everything belongs to God, not just to the state, everything belongs to God. And Prabhupada himself saw he had gone to Russia in 1971. At that time Russia was still communist, still socialist country. And Prabhupada saw, he said, one person was sweeping the road and another person was riding in the big car. So he said, how can you say everybody's equal? He said, it's not true. If everybody's equal, why is it one person's riding the big car and someone else is sweeping the road? And so it, it's just not true that everyone's equal. But on the spiritual platform, we can say everyone is equal. Materially, we're not equal. Materially, somebody is healthy and someone is sick, someone is rich and somebody is poor, someone is educated, someone is not educated. You don't find that equality on the material platform. But on the spiritual platform, everyone is equal as a soul. We're all part and parcel of the Supreme Lord Krishna. So in that sense, everyone is equal. So that is Bhagavata communism. Everything belongs to God. And if we accept this philosophy that everything belongs to God, we'll be happy, we'll be peaceful in our life. We don't think, this is mine, this is mine, give me. No, this is mine, you took mine. <laughs> People all th we are thinking, aham, first of all we think, aham, I am the body, and then they think, mamiti, this is mine, this belongs to me, my body. Right? The woman thinks, this is my husband. And the man thinks, this is my wife and these are my children, like this. We are thinking in terms of mind, but ultimately everything belongs to God. They're given to us by the grace of God. And they're taken from us also by the grace of God. Man proposes and God disposes. Srila Prabhupada said, God is like someone with ten arms. Now if somebody with ten arms wants to take from you, we only have two arms, so we have a difficult time to keep because he has ten arms so he can take everything from us. And if he wants to give us with his ten arms, he can give us so much also. So it's up to us. We have to surrender, take shelter of the Supreme Lord, recognize He is the proprietor and whatever He gives us, we use it in the proper manner. Don't be greedy to get more and be satisfied with what is given by the grace of God. That is the mode of goodness. If we are cultivating the mode of goodness, we have to learn to be satisfied. In the mode of passion, we want more, more. 
I don't have enough, I need more, greed, so much greed to get. And in the mode of ignorance, we don't know how to use what we've got. We only know how to be sinful and lazy and dirty. So Bhagavata communism is to understand that everything belongs to God. We want to try to propagate this communism. So we should not take anything neglectfully, neither we should be careless to take care of Krishna's property, Krishna's living beings, Krishna's house, Krishna's temple, Krishna's business. Sometimes devotees, you know, I, 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 I've been in the Krishna consciousness movement a very long time. So I, I remember in the beginning of our movement, sometimes devotees, we were, we were not very careful with things which were given to us by the grace of Krishna. Especially uh, in the beginning of our movement, we had vehicles, we would go out for Sankirtan and we would be given a vehicle to go out on Sankirtan and when we came back at night, we give the keys in again. But in the course of the day, we never check the tire pressure, we never check the water in the radiator, we never check the battery, we never cleaned the car, you know. We just thought, well, it's Krishna's car, you know. <laughs> and, we, and we never took care of it. So it's, it's very important for us to take care of Krishna's property. Uh, cleaning the temple. Uh, Bhakti Brihad Bhagavat Maharaj, they were telling me, one devotee was telling me how he'd come there to their temple and he was telling them, when do you clean the temple? You have to have a program to clean the temple. And he was saying, you know, every, he said, I have been temple president before, I've been a ma temple, manage, in temple management, we always must clean the temple every day, you have to have people clean the temple. Krishna's temple, and the same way Krishna's house, Krishna's business. We have to take care of Krishna's property. When we think it's mine, we'll take care of it. But if we think it belongs to Krishna, oh, it doesn't matter. So there's a saying about this, and they say, proprietorship turns sand into gold. Did you ever hear that expression before? Proprietorship will turn sand into gold. Even what you have is just some sand, it's not very valuable. But if it's yours, if it's your land, then, then you, wow, you know, it's mine, you know, get off my land. Hey, don't take my sand, you know. It belongs to me. We value it so much more, it's mine. So like that. And so when you know they're the proprietor of it, you take more care of it. So we have to understand it. it's quite different coming to Krishna consciousness that this is Krishna's property and we have to take care of it on behalf of Krishna. That's a, a, it's a whole consciousness which is required to understand everything belongs to Krishna and use it prop, take care of it properly. Prabhupada continues, Krishna's, everything Krishna's, isavashyam idam sarvam yakincha jagatyam jagat. If we think like that, then that is perfect Krishna consciousness. Think like what? Think that Everything is Krishna's property. Everything in the universe is his property. It's for his pleasure. That is Krishna consciousness. And then the second part of the verse says, Tena Chak Tena Bunjata, meaning Tena, by him, Chaktena, set apart quota, Bunjita, you should accept. 
One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota. Taking our quota, recognizing what is necessary for ourselves. I, I've been, I, I tr in the beginning of the class I tried to give you some examples of quota. Do you remember I told you the quota for the cow was what? Yes. Grass. And the quota for the lion? Yes. Right. Yeah, different quotas. So in the same way as human beings, human beings there's a quota. We're given certain things, you know, certain food which is actually meant for human consumption. We're not really meant to be killing animals. We're meant to live off land and to live off what are the gifts of nature in the form of grains and fruit and vegetables and milk and milk products. These things, that is the actual quota for civilized humans. People who are not quite so civilized then they may, they want to go for the non-vegetarian food. That is not actually the quota. That's going against the, the laws of the world. We have to be fair. <clears throat> so, we ask you, do you have any incidents, articles, where solutions would be achieved? if the Ishya-Vashya principle were to be applied. Well, we can look at the world today and we can look at the different problems which are around the world. Can, would anybody like to name any areas where there are problems in the world? Yes? Where are there problems in the world today? Huh? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Oh, very good, yes. Bangladesh. Excellent, right. Yeah. And, and you can see that the, the problem... Now, if we were to apply the Ishavasha principle there, recognizing that everything is the pro pro property of the Supreme Lord, and understanding that everyone should be allowed their quota, they should be, it's not that we want to deprive one community and only give uh, position and responsibility to another community. It's not that we want to be partial or show favoritism to one group of people over another. That is the problem. Discrimination between different sects and communities of people and it's created a havoc and, and ba Bengali people all over the world are very disturbed and very troubled by it. Mm, it's very unfortunate. So Bangladesh is one area but there's many other areas. Where else are there problems? Huh? Palestine, right, yeah. Palestine and the Israelis and their pro uh, Israeli, and yeah, uh, Kavi Chandra Swami was telling me he was just ready to go to Israel, but then <laughs> he just, the, the next day, the day before the flight, they cancelled all the flights, no more flights going into Israel because there's a threat of war, because Israel had bombed somebody and they bombed in Iran and they killed the leader of Iran and and so the Iranian people have declared war on Israel and in this way, you know, a huge big war is about to escalate there between Israeli people and the Palestinian people and the Iranian people. So the solution, if they would apply the Ishavasha principle, it could be resolved. If in the beginning if they had worked according to the Ishavasha principle and lived peacefully 
working off the land and being satisfied with the resources of the land, then been, there would be no need for all of this war, all of these conflicts which are going on. And then of course Russia and Ukraine, another big conflict there. All over the world you can find these issues going on. And then it, even in, the, in Europe today you find a lot of conflicts going on. There's a lot of rioting and uh, clashes between different races and communities. They're thinking, this is mine and not yours, why you come here, you shouldn't, go. <laughs> don't come here. Just like Srila Prabhupada used to experience himself, when he would travel, Prabhupada of course would go around the world and he'd come to different countries and he would describe how, how nasty sometimes the immigration officers could be. And he described them to be like barking dogs. And he would, he would say, they will, they will bark at you and say, why have you come here? Who told you to come here? <laughs> Please go away. Just like if you go to someone's house and they have a dog there, you know, then you, the, the dog will immediately come barking, right? The dog's message is, don't come here, I'm here, you go away. You know, the dog doesn't want people to come in, it's already there. Someone else is coming, an intruder. So that mood, that mentality is there in the human society. It's the dog mentality, but it's there among the human beings, everywhere. Different parts of the world, wherever you go, you get this kind of thing, people opposing you. <laughs> So Prabhupada points out, because it said, the verse said, we should take our quota, but not more than what we require. So Prabhupada commented on that in his lecture in London on the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada said, whatever wealth is there within this universe, all belong to God. And we are... As sons of God, we have got right to take advantage of this wealth, but not more than what I require. That's all. This is spiritual communism. If you take more, then you become punishable. This is the law of nature. So this is a very important point that we're, we're allowed our quota because we are all sons of God. So our Father, the Supreme Lord, He is the proprietor. Just like if your father is a rich man, then you can enjoy the property of your father. So the same way we are all sons of the Supreme Lord and the Supreme Lord is not a poor man. He's the husband of the goddess of fortune. So he's a very wealthy father. But we should only take what we need or what we require and don't take more. If you take more, then you get punished. So this is the problem, just like eating. If we eat more than what we're supposed to eat, what will happen? Constipation. Huh? Constipation. Constipation. Well, it depends what you eat, right? <laughs> if we eat more than what we're supposed to eat, then we may get diabetes, yeah. hypertension. hypertension maybe, yeah. You get some different health problems, health issues. The body reacts because we took more than what we were supposed to take. And if you don't eat enough, then you get also sick. 
In the Bhagavad Gita Krishna said, don't eat too much or eat too little. If you eat too little, what do you get? Huh? The malnutrition. <laughs> yeah, you get tuberculosis, TB, from undernourishment. So, you ha we have to know the balance, how much to eat, right? Don't take too much, don't take too little. And this is true also with uh, money. Money is the source of all evil, they used to say. There was a song like that. Uh, so we have to be careful about money, how much money we accumulate and how we use it. Don't waste it, use it carefully. Don't be extravagant, don't be miserly. Just use what is necessary for yourself and to maintain your family and meet your responsibilities. If we take more, then we become greedy for more. We become more and more attached and more and more blinded by the material world. Just like Haranyakashipu, he wanted more. And his brother Haranyaksha, he was always searching for gold. He was drilling up the earth going everywhere finding gold, wherever he could get gold. So this is the nature of materialistic people. They're so anxious for wealth, they want more and more. We have to learn, be satisfied with what is given by the grace of God. So, we ask you, give some areas in your life where you may be challenged in applying this principle. Maybe you have difficulty, for example, eating. Maybe you eat too much, right? So that might be one area which is a threat, to, which is a challenge to you. You might be, how, how could we overcome that? How could you, if you have a problem eating too much, what could you do to help yourself control? Huh? What should you do? Huh? Do some fasting. Yeah, you could have some principles like you don't eat at night. If you don't eat in the night and, and be careful, for example, be very careful about sweet meats and things like rice. One of the devotees in Singapore, she was studying at school and the teacher to told her mother, she said, don't give your daughter so much rice. <laughs> you know, she was taking rice and putting on weight. So that's a good teacher, right? The teacher is caring for the child. And she told the mother, be careful not to give your child too much rice because it will make her more and more fatty and she'll become s slow and slobbing. And so th that's one way to apply the principle, be strict in your eating. What would be another area we may be challenged? Maybe, maybe you're very rich, I don't know. Maybe nobody here has that problem, right? <laughs> uh, have more wealth than what you require. But the minister, actually that, that minister was here, the deputy, the chief minister who was here the other day for Rathyatra, he was saying here in Sarawak the pro there's no problem of less, the problem is too much. The people here in Sarawak, they all have too much. They have too much money, too much food. <laughs> and they, have, they, they get too much taken care of. He said, that's their problem. <coughs> and they said, they will grow up to hate their parents because their parents were feeding them more and more, 
eat more and more and you get bigger and bigger, you know. <laughs> And, 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 and later on then, the, oh, my mother, she always fed me too much, look at me now, you know. <laughs> so, we, we can be challenged in, in these different things, it's important for us. The principle is take our quota, quota could be also eating, money, it can be also uh, what, were, what would be some other areas where it might be a problem? Huh? Maybe, maybe clothing, dresses. You have so much clothes. <coughs> I was in Dubai, in the Middle East, that's another place people have too much, you know. Uh, so the, uh, I saw the government, the, the government had put different big metal boxes on the street and they say, place your extra clothing, unwanted clothing there. And so people will all come and they'll put their, because they all have so much clothes, there are many clothes and things, so I just, just put it there. And I saw in the airports now also, they have a thing, excess baggage, you know, <laughs> you, you, if you're, you've got too much baggage, you can just put it there. And it was full, some people, they'd thrown away so many things, you know. So, we, we have to be willing to let go, you know, get rid of, don't hold on, don't accumulate more than what we need. Try to keep it simple, all right? Uh, my god brother, Kavi Chandra Swami, he, he's, he would always say to me, he said, remember the KISS principle. I said, what KISS? He said, yes, K-I-S-S, -S. keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> so that was his, <laughs> his message to me. Keep it simple, keep our life simple, you know. Don't accumulate more, you know, oh, this computer and that thing and that and oh, and, oh, the latest iPhone comes out, wow, I have to get the latest iPhone, oh yeah. <laughs> so many, th these are things, we have to control the mind and the senses, it's a very important. And even with Krishna conscious paraphernalia, we can collect so much. We collect so much, have so many books. You go to people's home, they have so many books, have every book under this. Never read a lot of them, you know. But they have all the books, you know, have all. So these are problems, you know. And then the technology changes. We used to have real to real recording. Then it became cassette recording, then it became CDs, and then it became now USB, everything's on the, on the website, USB. So all the technology changes, you get rid of it, throw it away, you know. <laughs> but we, we cling on to it, we have all the technology, it goes back generations. We have to get rid of things, move with the technology. <coughs> Right? How you would overcome these challenges? How would you overcome these challenges? We said eating too much, you have to be careful. Don't eat at night. Be careful about rice. Be careful about heavy foods, it's sweets and things, taking too many sweets. There's also problems. Prabhupada used to give us basic staple food during the week, meant rice, dal, chapati and a little sabji, and a feast one day a week. One day a week there would be sweets and puris and halava, but the rest of the week, rice, dal, chapati, sabji, just like that. And every morning we'd have chickpea and it was rationed about, you know, eight chickpeas, 
<laughs> you're not not a big plate of chickpeas, you know. You, because chickpeas are full of so much protein, so just a few. Like that, you have to be very controlled and careful to control these things. And challenges, look in your wardrobe and see what you're using and what you don't use. And then get rid of it. You give it away or put it away, so give to some people who can use it. So like this we want to overcome these challenges. How could our society be improved through application of the Ishyavashya or Bhagavata Communism principle? How could our society be Im improved? Yes, if we will, if we will all practice this Isavasya principle or this Bhagavata communism principle, how will our society be improved? We'll all be living happily together, cooperating nicely together without any envy, without any bitterness. We'll all live together harmoniously, working together for the service of Lord Krishna. So that is the Ishavasya society. We want that society. An Ishavasya society means a society with God in the center. And mantra two then continues, if you don't do this, then what will happen? No, oh, no, this is, first of all, what will happen if you do this? If you do this, then he can go on working in that way. And that sort of work will not bind him to the law of karma. There's no alternative to this. This is the benefits of working in the Ishavasya way, in God consciousness. That you can live a long life and you, can, you will not be tied up by the law of karma. Because you're working for Krishna, there's no karma. So you're not bound to the material world. So this is important for us. If we work like this, we're free of karma. And then the third mantra decides what describes what happens if you don't do it. The killer of the soul, whoever he may be, must enter into the planets known as the worlds of the faithless full of darkness and ignorance. So that means if we are working just simply for our own self, if we are selfish, then we are killing the soul and we are going to go into the world of the faithless, where people have no faith, full of darkness and ignorance. The mode of ignorance is prominent will enter into that kind of existence. So we want to be very cautious, very careful to avoid that kind of destiny. That's mantra three. Prabhupada gives an example about a boat, right? But the human form of life is like a boat, right? You have the human body, it's like a nice boat to cross the ocean. But on the boat, you need the captain, the captain of the ship, the spiritual teacher. And not only captain, you need to have good winds, favorable winds. And that is the instructions of the Lord. So with the instructions of the Lord and with the help of a good captain, with the human body, we can cross over the ocean of material existence. Prabhupada quotes a verse from the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam that the human being who does not utilize the human life to cross the ocean of material existence must be considered the killer of his own soul. Atmahana, right? Killer of the soul. Now the soul, we said the soul cannot be killed. For the soul there's no birth and there's no death. So how can they talk about the killer of the soul? Because we're denying the actual purpose of the soul and the need of the soul. 
The need of the soul is to connect to the Supreme Soul. And unless we connect to the Supreme Soul, then we have wasted this human life. So we're killing the soul by neglecting the need of the soul. We are killing it. So we don't want to do that. We want to nourish the soul. And the way to nourish it is by giving it Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada explains, if with all these facilities a human being does not fully utilize his life for self-realization, he must be considered Atmaha, a killer of the soul. Ishopanishad warns in clear terms that the killer of the soul is destined to enter into the darkest region of ignorance, to suffer perpetually. So this is the meaning of killing the soul. We don't utilize our life for self-realization. All right, so what did we cover tonight? We explained these terms. Isavashya, meaning? What does it mean? Isavashya means? Society with God in the center, right? Para and apara, prakriti. Para is spiritual energy and apara and Bhagavata communism and atmaha, the killer of the soul, right? And the flow from mantra one to mantra three. What mantra one described the principle, mantra two described the results of following the principle, and mantra three describes what happens if you don't follow the principle. Right? And we spoke about these kind of things, accepting our quota, tena chaktena bunjitaha, how to apply it in our life, and current affairs where Ishavasha principle could be applied. We talked about Bangladesh and different things. Then examples from Prabhupada's life showing his application of the Isavasya principle. Anybody knows any examples? Prabhupada's life? How did he apply this principle of Isavasya? Yes? What did he do? What did he say which showed that Isavasya principle? Well, one thing he said in Mayapur, no one should go hungry within five kilometers of the temple, right? Everyone must be given proper food, everyone should be cared for. <coughs> if Prabhupada was on a morning walk and he saw the tap running and nobody was there, the water is just running, he said, go and turn the tap off. Take care, don't waste resources. And Prabhupada was very careful, he, he, if he got envelopes, he would open up the envelope, use it to write on, keep his notes on it and everything. He, he was very careful, very frugal, he did not waste anything. Because everything is Krishna's, must use it carefully. Analogies, we had the example of the boat on the ocean, society could be improved. How to improve this, how, how to apply this within our society? Well, we encourage the devotees, work together, help each other, taking care of each other, being concerned for everyone. It certainly helps us to become more God conscious. My final quote from Prabhupada. There's no harm in becoming a family man or an altruist, a socialist, a communist, a nationalist or a humanitarian provided that one executes his activities in relation with Ishavasya, the God-centered conception. So we're not against any of these things, so long as you're God-conscious, that's all. Sri Upanishad advises us to exert our energy in the spirit of Isavasya, 
Being so engaged, we may wish to live for many, many years. Jai, Srila Prabhupada ki. Go back to Vrindaki. Any questions? Anyone? Yes. There is one, uh, I'm from India. There is one great uh, writing of uh, uh, Bhagavan Nam, you know, he was, like, uh, he was before very richest person. He is never used to give a single prayer to anybody. Then because of his blessings, he then become a great uh, songs writing, you know, uh, writer. Then he prepared so many songs, thousands, thousands, lakhs of songs for I want to sing to my Lord. Can I? You have to ask the temple president here. Yeah. Because uh, today I'm leaving this tomorrow morning in this temple. I want to uh, pray my life. Hare Krishna, do you want to sing for Krishna? Yes, Guruji. So you can sing personally to Krishna? Yes. Mataji, do you want to sing song for Krishna? Krishna song for me, Guruji. I understand, yeah. but uh, you can sing another day, but you, you can sing Krishna anytime, not a problem. No, 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 Yeah. After the program, you can sing. Huh? If you permit, I can sing. Yeah, no, we've got a program now, after this, Maharaj has to go, and after the program, you can sing Krishna. Okay, okay. Yeah? okay. Thank you. We can do that after. Yeah, we're just finishing. We'll just... Any other question? Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur back to Vrinda ki. See you tomorrow again, 7.30. Good evening. Hare Krishna.